Hi, I'm Ira Block, Sony Artisan of Imagery. I've been taking pictures for over 35 years. I started way back in the days of film. I'm lucky to have been associated with the National Geographic magazine through most of my career. It's given me the ability to travel to a lot of great locations and work on some fantastic stories. One of the things about shooting pictures and shooting really good pictures is you have to learn the difference between what your mind and your eyes see and how the camera sees a picture. And I hope today you could learn from my experiences and my mistakes how to grow and take better pictures. In this video, you will learn about planning before you shoot, the key components of a photo, including light, composition, and moment, the Sony gear I use, high ISO and fast shutter speeds, the wide dynamic range of Sony cameras, picking a theme, landscapes and cityscapes, and finally, social media and Wi-Fi. Before I head out somewhere, I research a place to try to learn about its culture. I want to come up with images that are deeper and more intimate than the normal tourist images. When I was first starting out in photography, getting information about a place meant going to libraries and looking through encyclopedias and books. And now, of course, it's simple. Just go online, you Google a place, you can see a lot of pictures of a place. When I look at pictures of a place that have already been shot, it gives me an idea of what the place looks like. But I'm very careful about not going out with too many pre-conceptual ideas about a place. Now with the Sony cameras, I'm able to get much more intimate pictures because they're small and people aren't intimidated by them. I'm able to get into more intimate situations and people don't freak out as they did when they see a large camera and big lenses. The small Sony mirrorless cameras have been really terrific for me in my shooting. I'm able to be much more unobtrusive and be sort of stealth when I'm moving around. Even with these incredible cameras, you have to spend time thinking about what you're shooting. You have to look for images. You just can't point and shoot. You have to think and shoot before you take a great picture. And doing this takes experience, practice. So taking more pictures and making more mistakes really help you grow as a photographer. Let's take a look at how I see and find images, how I convey information and tell a story about a place or a culture. The key components in making any photo are light, composition, and moment. Usually, I'm attracted to light. That catches my eye and that begins to get the process going. Once I find the light, I then stay with the situation and I keep shooting and I wait for some special moment to happen. In this picture, I saw some great light from the monks walking around holding candles and I started shooting. I got really lucky. I saw a monk pick up his phone and do a selfie of himself. It helps tell the story. Here I have some monks in Laos who were in an ancient city, and they're walking around with cell phones. It shows a juxtaposition of culture. I was photographing these kids playing baseball in central Havana, and the light was really getting nice. I could see these great long shadows, and I thought, this may look good from a higher angle. So I talked my way into somebody's apartment, got on their terrace, and bent over to shoot this photo through all the laundry that was hanging out to dry. And it was terrific. Wow, I'm looking at the shadows and I'm just shooting. I'm waiting for everyone's shadow to be just right so you could see the separation of the bat in the kid's hand in the shadow. I found I had one image where the ball, the white baseball, was going through a dark shadow. 
So not only did I have the great shadows of the kids, I actually have the ball in this picture. So it really, really just worked out perfectly. My always on the camera lens is the 24 to 70. It's a great focal length. I could do those wide shots or I could zoom to 70 and get some closer in shots of people. But there are times when I've got to switch to a longer lens, so I go right to the 70 to 200. And I was shooting at a night game with the 70 to 200, and I wanted to cover the action. To do this, to capture the action and to freeze it, I had to use a high shutter speed, and because the stadium is not so well lit, I had to boost my ISO up to about 5,000. And with these Sony cameras, 5,000 is a piece of cake. I really like shooting in low light, moody light, and at night. And that's when I do need the high ISO. When I'm shooting at night, I like to use prime lenses with big apertures. My favorites, the 55 1.8 and the 28 f2. In my early career when I was shooting with film, ISO 200, 400 was the max I could get for transparency film. Now, 200 to 400, that's my starting point. And here's an incredible example. I'm in Morocco and I'm shooting at ISO, let me get this right, 51,200. And this was the 55, 1.8 lens and I was probably shooting 125th, and yet the look of the image is terrific. The woman's skin tone is just incredible. It really held detail in her skin, and as far as the noise, well, the noise here looks like grain when I used to shoot Tri-X film and push it a little bit. So it doesn't have the feel of noise. It has a feel of, you know, film grain, and it just is, you know, phenomenal. And if you look carefully, you'll see a guy in the background trying to do a picture on his phone, and I'm sure his image is not coming out. I was out in the desert, staying in a tent, and some of the locals came out and started playing music. This was made totally by candlelight. And again, ISO 51,200. 55 millimeter, 1.8 lens, 125th of a second at 1.8. Besides the fact that the noise, the grain, is not bad, is the fact that the dynamic range, you're seeing detail in places that you'd be surprised to find detail. The other advantage to the Sony cameras in the high ISO is that I could shoot in early morning light, and here I'm on a boat in Inlay Lake, in Myanmar, and on a boat, you need a fairly good shutter speed, a 250th of a second. Now, my ISO isn't high here. It's probably 5,000 or 6,400. What helped me a lot was the fire. The, you know, I have this nice blue tone, and the fisherman is sort of framed a bit by the mountain range in the back that's blue and the water that's blue, and I've got this golden light coming off the fire, and he's got great body language. Really helps the picture. So this all came together because I could shoot at 5,000 ISO on this image. These monks in Bhutan were praying in a dark temple, and there was some light coming through the window, and it was bouncing off this bright colored floor back onto their faces. Again, I was at 5,000 ISO, and I was able to make a picture in a situation that I wouldn't have been able to do 15 years ago, maybe even 10 years ago. In Myanmar, we were out on the street and this girl was selling some jewelry and I just love the paint on her face. It's called Tanaka. And she was lit with the flashlights in camera phones. I'm shooting her again, 5,000 ISO. And here's a moment, I waited and waited till she turned her eyes up and smiled. And I got the moment. We're back in Cuba, back to Cuban baseball. At a night game, I was shooting a fan in the stands and it was really dark. And I needed again to shoot 
at a reasonable shutter speed, a two fiftieth of a second, because he's moving around, and I'm able to do it. For me and for you, I think it's very important to work at a really high shutter speed, even when it's not that dark. Even if you're in a market like I was here, I like to shoot at ISO 800 or 1000, so I again can work a decent shutter speed when I'm shooting someone and their head's moving like this. If you're at 125th, you're gonna see movement in the chin. So I like to be at least at a 250th when I'm shooting people. The five axis stabilization is terrific and it's great at stabilizing you when you're holding the camera. But again, it only stabilizes you. It doesn't stabilize the motion in your subject. So if you're shooting people moving, you need to be at a high shutter speed. And I think it's a mistake that most people make. They're afraid to move their ISOs up. And they'll say, hey, look, look at this great picture, ISO 200 or 400. And I look at the picture and it's blurred. Well, if the picture's blurred, it's no good. So you might as well take advantage of what these cameras can do. Move your shutter speed up. Going to 1,000, 2,000, 3,200 is nothing. Keep your ISO high so you can keep your shutter speed up. Keep your lens open more. Don't worry so much about depth of field in most pictures. Worry about blur and movement. It's amazing that even at high ISO, the Sony cameras have an incredible dynamic range. I did a series of these ballet dancers in an old house in Cuba, and I just found some interesting light. And in this image, I've got sunlight coming through the doorway. Her dress is not blown out. The background has incredible detail and her face has incredible detail. The dynamic range just keeps pictures alive. I could never have done this shot in the days of film, nor could I have done this shot five years ago with another digital camera. Another shot in this old house was in this bedroom. I took both these pictures with my go-to lens, the 24 to 70. And I turned a fluorescent light on that was behind the bed, and yet, the light source, the available light, the colors, the dress, the white of the bed, everything has great detail. Nothing's blown out, nothing's overexposed. I saw this great scene on a mountaintop in Bhutan. I like the tree and I like the stupa at this monastery. Good mountain range in the back. Suddenly I get lucky. A nun starts walking on the pathway. And again, the dynamic range of the sensors makes it possible I've got some detail and you can see the shape of the mountains in the back. Do you see detail in the stupa? You see a little bit of detail in the nun and nothing's out of range here, it's great. It's important for me to have this dynamic range. Now there are some situations I shoot in where I'm controlling the light. But a lot of situations, if I'm shooting something really natural light, I need that dynamic range. I need to be able to get information in highlights. I need to get information in shadows. And it's important for me to be able to do that. I believe the Sony cameras have 14 stop dynamic range, which is just phenomenal. Many people just like to pick up their camera, grab their zoom lens, twist it, take a picture and walk away. That's not gonna make great photos. I zoom with my feet. I try to get closer to my subject. When I get closer, I'm able to walk around the subject and explore the subject. Wow, maybe the light's better from the other side. Maybe the person has a better angle. Maybe the background's better. You need to explore your subject and walk around. And be very careful, when you're looking through the viewfinder, you tend to concentrate on what's going on in the middle of the frame. Train your eyes to look 
around the entire frame, not just the center. You've got all this space to use and you want all the information in that picture to matter, to add to your picture. I like using wider lenses like the 24 to 70 and working with it on the wider side. I like to show my subject in their environment. It gives you a lot more information. Plus it looks much more intimate. When you're shooting with a long telephoto lens from across the street, the pictures have a look of a paparazzi. I was at a temple in Mongolia and I saw this family and I just got in close and actually you know, low angle with a wider lens and got some candles in the picture, got some background and got the people. In the next shot, I was at a bazaar in Morocco and I was just walking around again with a wider lens and I, I got interested in the mirrors and the reflections. And I think in one of the mirrors, you see a reflection of me, but I like the reflection of the baby in the mirror, the woman in the foreground, the guy selling the mirrors, and then you get the sense of background with the buildings and lights. 28 millimeters is my sweet spot for a lens length when I'm trying to do people and combine them with the background. And I could do it either using the 24 to 70, or if it's night and I need a faster lens, I'll switch to the 28 F2 prime. I saw this band playing. I love the color red on the guy with the drum. So I got close to him with a wider lens and still had the colors of the rest of the group in the background. So I was able to combine this foreground red with these other colors in the background. It gave some depth to my photo. I don't always have to put a person in the foreground. Here, I've used the old Cuban car in the foreground and the person was in the background. And it still made a good picture because I kept the car big and the car has terrific lines and using all the different blue colors added to the layering of the photo. Another example is this baseball picture in Cuba where I saw this family watching their son play ball. So I framed this child between the two parents. They created my foreground and I had a wider lens so you get an expansive view of the background and it's great that the woman has a bat in her hand. It tells the story. She's holding a baseball cap in her left hand and you could see the kid throwing the ball between the two of them. I'm telling a story and I'm using layers of foreground, middle ground, background. This is a really good example in Mongolia. I saw the two people working with the goat and I had the yurts in the background, but there were some holes in the picture. So I just waited. The little girl moved in from the right. She filled the space. The guy moved in on the left. He filled the space. And then I really got lucky and this dog walks by right in front of the yurt and it filled the space. And if you look really carefully in the far left, besides the guy, there's a horse. So I have different things going on and they're filling the composition, plus they're leading your eye into the photo and they're giving you more information, telling you a better story. Backgrounds can cause a lot of problems and distraction for you. You could have a busy background, you could have things growing out of people's heads. So a background could be bad for your picture or if you look for a good background, it could be an added point to your picture. So I look for an interesting background and then I wait for something to happen in front of it. Now waiting takes time and waiting takes patience but it's well worth it. Here's a picture in Cuba of Che Guevara and I had people walking by it and I waited and shot and shot until this kid walks by with a red bag and he's wearing red pants and the red really worked well with the color of the background. So all my other pictures didn't work, this one did work, but I found the background first 
I love the way this wall looked. It was just terrific colors, terrific texture. And then that little bit of laundry hanging in the window really looked great for me. And these kids were playing baseball and I just waited until I had the right combination of things happening in front of the wall. The kid's head turning towards me. So he's looking at me, I'm getting a sense of the kid. The other kid's in the background, one kid's taking his shirt off. All these factors are working with the picture. And then I've got a couple of layers here. I have this kid in the foreground, the kid's in the middle ground, and then I've got my sensational background. I was shooting in the ballet school, I took a break, and I noticed this fantastic staircase with different layers happening. And I thought this would be a good starting point for a photo. And I saw some people coming up and down, and I set myself up, and I just waited until this group of ballet dancers started going down the staircase. They had the right color, the right body positions, it all worked out. So patience, is really important. As long as we're talking about staircases, here's another shot I did with this young lady in the staircase. The light through the window looked good, so I positioned her, but I was so careful about the positioning. If you look, her head is framed right between that window frame. Had she moved her head to the left or the right, there may have been part of the window frame cutting through her head. So I was very careful on the way I framed her. It just has this magical look with the light coming behind her and then the lines of the staircase. I try to find unusual angles sometimes in my shooting. When we looked at that picture in the temple in Mongolia, I was at a low angle. Here, with this picture of the nuns in Myanmar, I'm at a high angle. How did I do all this? The flip out screen on the Sony's is terrific. So for the low angle, I could just pull the screen out, drop down a little bit and get the camera really low. And for this one, flip the screen out, raised it up over my head and I got the high angle. Now I waited on this one. I was shooting, waiting, shooting, waiting. And I finally got the moment where the little girl on the left turns her head up and looks at me. I had to stay there for quite a while with my arms up, but I was able to make the picture thanks to the flip out screen. It really makes a difference. It's something that I never thought I would use and I use it all the time now. So most times I like to shoot people and show their environment, but if the people have a terrific face, I'll go in close. The 90 millimeter macro is a fantastic lens. It is so sharp. I love using it. And the other great thing, it's a 2.8 lens. In this picture, I was at the Chinese opera and I got to go backstage. It was dark, but I had my 7R2 and I was able to set the ISO to 3200 and shoot it about a 250th of a second wide open at 2.8. And it really, really made some great pictures. I love the way the background goes out of focus and light sources just become, you know, these beautiful dots in my picture. And you can just see the bouquet in this picture and how terrific the woman looks. I mentioned earlier about zooming with your feet, getting closer, walking around, taking different pictures. Work the scene, look around, things will get better. Sometimes maybe not, but you've got to take that chance. You don't know until you try. So I was at this temple in Yangon and I was shooting it, it was night and I was moving around shooting it. And I've got a standard picture of it here. It looks nice, sky's nice, good color, but I wanted more. So I kept moving around and I got the next picture which has people in it, but it's still not doing it for me. It's a start. I'm, look, I'm thinking, I want to show how big this temple is, so I really need to have some people in it for scale. This picture is starting to show the size, but it's too plain. Now, I've done something a little more. I've got a person 
in my foreground. It really shows the size. He's taking a picture with his camera phone, which is some sort of action. And if you look carefully in the lower right-hand corner, there's another person taking a picture with their camera phone. So I'm starting to get there. I'm starting to get a balance. Things are happening. I change to a vertical orientation and I get a photo that's working even better maybe and that's with the two monks doing a picture of themselves and a couple off to the side. So I'm never satisfied. You can't be satisfied if you're a photographer. You have to keep trying. There's always something better going on. You just have to find it. When I'm shooting people, besides moments, there's nuances and body language. It's these little things that take a good or average picture and transform it into a great image. It's a small nuance, but to me it's very important, especially if you're doing something like a silhouette. This picture of the fisherman is almost there for me. It's not perfect. I have a couple of issues with it. The main issue is that his head is not turned enough for me to see a profile of his nose. It's a great picture, I'm happy with it, but what would make me happier had I had his head turned just a little bit more so I'd get the profile of the nose. I get very picky about my photos, but you have to. You have to look at your photos critically and learn from them so in the future you'll make better images. And this image I did get the guy's nose, plus this has a little more layering. I've got his boat in the foreground. The motor of the boat really stands out and has a nice shape. He's at the bow of the boat with his fishing net. And in the background is another boat going through the water. And all this is happening in some beautiful golden light with a little fog going on. It's, you know, really a nice image. And again, I'm at a high shutter speed. Look at that boat in the background. It looks like a canoe with a motor on it. That's the kind of boat I'm shooting from. So the boat I'm shooting from is bouncing around a bit. High shutter speed and your picture's not blurry. In Myanmar, I saw this novice monk adjusting his robe and there was beautiful backlighting coming through a doorway and it gave this terrific silhouette effect. So I did this picture, but I stayed with the situation. This picture's not bad, but let's look at the next picture. His robe drops just a little bit. I was careful about my metering on this picture. I just wanted the detail of the light coming through the red robe. And I could see his face, and I could see the silhouette of his nose, and I'm really lucky He's getting a beautiful little highlight on his face. Even when you do landscapes, and I like to include people in my landscapes, I look for these nuances. Here's a boat going into a little village. Now, it looks like a fine image, but the people aren't as defined and you don't see much action. The next image, however, look at the paddles. The paddles are out of the water, they're holding the paddles. The body language is different and makes the image much more dynamic. The same thing is happening here. I was photographing these fishermen in front of Mount Fuji. Not a bad picture. Again, foreground of fishermen. Middle ground, I've got this layer of fog. In the background, I have Mount Fuji with a little cloud over the top of the mountain. Picture's not bad, but look at the fisherman in the foreground. He looks okay, but in the next image, he's got his hands up. Just a little different body language. For me, makes the picture better. In photography, you're combining a lot of elements in your image. A lot of things going on. There are things that add to the picture, which make it a great picture, just as there are things that distract from the picture stuff in the background, garbage in the background, busy background, bright spots in the background, those will distract from your image. 
When I start a story, I don't want to be all over the place. I like to have some sort of theme. One of the things I've just finished doing was a project on baseball in Cuba and the importance of baseball to Cuba's culture. As part of the cultural extent of baseball, I thought getting some older players would sort of round the whole thing out. And I went out to start shooting, and I was going to shoot the action, but the faces and these guys were so terrific, and their uniforms were all so different, I thought, this is a natural to make portraits. On this Veterans League, there was a 50-year-old woman playing with the, all the guys, and she was just an incredible player, and she's playing catcher for them, and I loved all the catcher's equipment she had, so she was the first one I photographed. I found a nice wall, my background, but I wanted a little more pop in these pictures, so I brought my big strobe and umbrella to light them a little bit, just to give a little more sharpness to the image and to really pop the colors out. Let's look at a couple of more images from my Cuban baseball project. This is one of the young kids who's totally interested in playing ball and I liked the background, and I put a strobe on him because he had those cool sunglasses on. I love the colors in Cuba, and I tried working with the colors in Cuba, so incredible blues here, and the ball player behind the fence just attracted me right away. And what was I careful about doing in this picture? I wanted to make sure that his eye was not getting obstructed by the fence. So I looked for these small little details. In this picture, the, um, I'm at a baseball game and all the action's going on behind me, but I needed more grassroots people involvement. So I turned around, I looked through the stands, and I found a couple, and I knew this couple, they were getting a little close and friendly, and I waited and I stood there and boom, they kissed. So it just made for a moment for me. I was walking outside a stadium and I noticed this ticket window and the woman was looking out and it looked like she was floating in space because of the way the white was. It's not a situation where I'm going to walk by and just snap the shutter and keep going. It's a situation where I want it to work for me. There's a lot going on. I'm working the composition. I'm working where she's positioned. I have to talk to the person. I have to start interacting with that person, which is an important part about being a photographer. I came over and I started shooting her. I had the 24 to 70 on the camera. I switched to the 16 to 35 because the 16 to 35 going wider seemed to give this more of a floating effect. It just worked well. The colors worked well. And again, I have her face in between the gate that she's looking at. So you really can get into her face. I mentioned the colors in Cuba, I mentioned the background. Here's a great example. I love this corner. The colors are terrific, and I love the fact that the walls are going at it at an angle. And this kid was playing baseball in front of it, and I just captured this moment. The ball's in the right place, the bat's in the right place. His clothing, the blue pants, the white shirt, all the colors really match. Had he been wearing red or black, it wouldn't have the same appeal. So there's a lot going on when you have to make a good picture. There's a lot of elements. In this picture, we just have a very quiet moment between this kid and this ball player in the dugout. The way they're looking at each other, the colors again, everything just came together and made a nice little moment. I was driving around and we saw this building and these kids playing ball. Well, this was some old sports center and the background was great. It's got the Cuban flag and it's got a baseball. It's telling my story. And I just caught the kid throwing his ball in the same position as the ball on the background and it just made the picture and another element is he's wearing these bright colored pants. The background has subdued colors. His pants are a little brighter. Everything starts working together. When I was shooting baseball in Cuba, 
I wasn't shooting it just for the action or for the news and timeliness of the game. I was trying to capture the poetry of the game of baseball. And I think this image really speaks to that. I was focused on home plate. I knew this runner was gonna come in and I got this fantastic image of the player, the dust spinning around, the body language, the colors, it just all added up. Another example of using the longer lens and getting some action but getting some background is the shot of the guy sliding into home plate. I love working with people, but of course I need to shoot landscapes to complete my story. So in my landscapes I try to include people, but I like to shoot landscapes that also have some sort of mood. I like to shoot more into the light, and I like to use atmospherics. Now this image has a real mood to it. Sun rising, fog coming off the water, and a boat going through the river. Behind the boat, you get this nice wake going through the water. You get to see the fog more. It's a great mood picture. Again, the dynamic range of the Sony sensors makes pictures like this possible. Even though it's a sort of silhouette, I'm getting detail in things that are unbelievable. You could look at the boat and there's a little reflection of the boat in the water. The sun reflecting in the water has detail in it. The trees in the background have detail. The shape of the house is defined really nicely. Even though it's dark against the dark mountains, it still defines itself. My ability to shoot these moody scenics and landscapes is possible now with this great dynamic range. The temples here in Bagan, Myanmar are really fantastic. And I was trying to get a shot showing the great amount of temples. I didn't want to just do a wide shot. I needed something in the foreground. When I do landscapes, I call it an anchor. You need something in the image that's big, that brings you into the image. Then your background could start spreading out and getting smaller, but you need one bigger thing somewhere in the picture to give you that difference of size relationship. So here in Bagan, it was a foggy morning and a lot of smoke, but I put a temple in the foreground and let everything pass through in the background. When I talk about anchoring a landscape with something big in the foreground, it could be anything. In this case, it's this line of trees that have a nice diagonal line and lead you through the snow to see this red and white church. These barren trees really sort of bring your eye right to the church and it fills a part of the frame. In this case, I knew that there would be balloons coming through the sky in Bagan, Myanmar. And I wanted something in the foreground so I found a piece of a temple, put that in my foreground, put some other temples in the background, and I waited. And when it happened, I was ready. I've got these balloons coming across the sky through the sun. I have a foreground here, that piece of temple. I have a middle ground here, those other temples. And then I've got a background, the balloons coming across the sky. Here you've got this ancient city that's changing with tourism. The tourists have come, they're helping the economy, and one of the ways is they take these balloon rides. So again, this is part of the story. I wanted to show the old and the new. I did the same thing here. You look at this picture and you go, wow, that's a nice picture. It is. But I wanted to make it a better picture. I had done my research, I had done my planning, I knew the balloons would be coming through here, so I did another picture with the balloons coming right across the sunset. In photography, you have to be nimble, you have to know where your settings are, you have to be ready for something to happen. I was getting warmed up, but of course the balloons showed up not exactly where I thought they would be, but I was able to swing the camera maybe 
move my tripod a little bit and get the final image. And I was so jealous of all the people going up in the balloons that I had to go for a ride myself. So the next day I was in a balloon and I photographed this other balloon coming across a river which added a lot to the image. Working at night or at dusk or at sunrise, or dawn is another good time to shoot these landscapes. Here's the Fort El Morro in Havana and it was catching some natural light along the side of the wall that was warm and contrasted with the blue light of the sky. Made for a great picture, plus I've got a nice angle of the fort coming to me. I've got a point in the background showing the lighthouse. All these different elements add up and create a nice image. With these night shots like that fort picture, I'm always looking for a source of light that gives me some contrast, some difference. It's about two o'clock in the morning, I got back to my hotel, getting ready to go to sleep, and I look out my window and I see this aurora. Now, across the street from my hotel was a house that was getting a red glow from the hotel's neon sign and I was able to get a shot of the aurora and the red house. So in this case, my light contrast is making this photo work. The reds and the greens give incredible contrast to the situation. I'm aware of light, I'm aware of the color of light. I like to do night shots with stars. Here I'm in the Himalayas and I was shooting at a slower shutter speed. Now you could see it's a slow shutter speed because the stars are moving. Well, actually the Earth's moving and the stars seem to be moving. And the clouds going over the mountain peak are also getting a little blurred from the slow shutter speed. But if you don't want the stars to have the appearance of moving, you've got to shoot a little differently. Like in this photo in Mongolia. It was a beautiful clear night in Mongolia and the Milky Way was rising. I set up my camera, but again, I didn't want to do just a shot of the sky. I needed an anchor in the foreground. So I put this yurt in the foreground. Now the yurt was pitch black. How was I going to get color on it? I took a flashlight and I, during that 30 second exposure, I just painted light onto the yurt. So now I've got the yurt and a beautiful Milky Way. But am I finished? Not really. I had planned the shoot to finish before the moon came up. The moon is too bright and the Milky Way disappears from your eyes. I was packing the cameras up and I looked off to the side and I saw this brilliant glow coming up over the horizon, almost like a sunrise. But it was the moon rising and I noticed on the yurt the moon was putting a golden glow. I took a few frames and then the moon actually popped up and the Milky Way disappeared. And this picture has this beautiful golden glow. You could even see on the horizon a bit of a glow. The moral to the story, nature does a better job of lighting than I do. When I talk about landscapes, I also want to bring the idea of shooting cityscapes into the discussion. Cityscapes are a landscape to themselves. Here's a shot of Manhattan at night with the Empire State Building. Now, I don't shoot at the dark of night. I shoot after the sun sets. There's about an hour of time when the sky gets this nice blue color. And you could start seeing differentiations in the clouds. And also, there's still enough light in the sky that it helps outline the buildings. So there's a perfect time to shoot. Early in the morning, right before the sun comes up or late in the afternoon, right after the sun sets. This is an unusual event. I was shopping on 6th Avenue in Manhattan and I walked out of the store and I saw this fantastic sunset. I had my Sony RX100 version 4 in my pocket. When I'm not carrying my professional cameras with me, I at least have the Sony RX100 version 4 with me. 
It's a terrific piece of equipment. It's amazing I was able to get this shot with it. And what's the best camera? It's the one you have with you. In the past, my relationship was with photo editors, editors in magazines. There was a lot of layers between what I initially shot and what eventually gets published. Social media, it's very direct. I'm hearing from people. I find out what they like, what they don't like. I post a picture on social media and I see what affects them. I see how my photographs are doing out there in the world. People come back to me. It's the new way that I communicate. It's extraordinary. Traveling around the world, I could be anywhere, take an image with my Sony camera, turn the Wi-Fi on, send that image to my cell phone, and from my cell phone, it goes anywhere I want. I try not to do trivial photos on my social media accounts. I'm a photographer and I'm a storyteller, so my social media needs to reflect that. In this video, you learned about planning before you shoot, the key components of a photo including light, composition, and moment, the Sony gear I use, high ISO and fast shutter speeds, the wide dynamic range of Sony cameras. You also learned about picking a theme, landscapes and cityscapes, and finally, social media and Wi-Fi. Keep all this in mind, keep practicing, and you'll take better pictures.